zusammen. Äh, schön, dass wieder sehr viele da sind. Äh, mein Name ist Lassa Monterno vom Bayerischen Basketballverband. Ich werde die Intro auf Deutsch machen und dann switchen wir auf Englisch, äh, weil unser Gast heute ist äh, ja, aus den USA, beziehungsweise eher gesagt aus Kanada und lebt in den USA. Ähm, BWV Coach Klinik, äh, einmal kurz die ganzen Sachen drumherum. Also wir haben uns geeinigt, dass erstmal die Mikrofone stumm sind und wir die Fragen ganz am Ende stellen. Äh, deswegen bitte könnt schon mal im Chat eure Fragen während der Präsentation äh, uns schreiben und wir würden euch dann am Ende freistellen, sodass ihr selber die Fragen stellen könnt. Aber die Fragen kommen dann am Ende. Äh, Coach Klinik wird aufgenommen äh, und Filmen mit eigenen Medien ist nicht erlaubt. Kurz drumherum, was wir noch äh, ja, währenddessen in Bayern machen, ist zwar ist das Online-Training, das jetzt stattfindet in der sechsten Woche. Und zwar, ihr seht hier, wer dran ist, wenn ihr äh, Spieler habt, äh, die jetzt gerade nicht trainieren, insbesondere jetzt ab Mittwoch vielleicht noch mehr. Äh, dass die Möglichkeit gibt es am Mittwoch um 17 Uhr bis 17.45 Uhr ist zum Beispiel jetzt FC Bayern dran. Das war das Ganze drumherum und ich würde starten dann jetzt auf Englisch zu, zu switchen. So, hi Chris, uh, first of all I want you to thank you for, for accepting our in invitation and I'm really glad that you, 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 yeah, you came here and you are with us at the Bavarian Coach Clinics and personally I follow you. I think a lot of, of, of coaches which are here follow you on, on Immersion, on your podcast, uh, and we are excited having you here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm grateful to be able to be here to be able to share the game with you all. I, I chose this picture because uh, it shows on one side that you as a teacher and also you in an Immersion uh, t-shirt. Uh, could you tell us what made you become a coach and what is emotion, immersion about? Well, first off, the coaching piece. Uh, I'm sure like many people, as a young basketball player, uh, I fell in love with basketball because it was one of the sports growing up in Canada in particular, one of the sports that I could do by myself. And I could practice on my own. I could get better on my own. And I quickly learned the other part of it, which was the mental side of the game. Uh, even if I wasn't the best athlete, there's always ways to find an advantage in sports, but particularly in basketball, I was fascinated by that part of it. So I learned early on uh, about the tactical side and fell in love with the technical and tactical side of the game. And then more so as I started to actually coach, uh, particularly young people, I fell in love with the opportunity to be able to see people grow. And it's just unique opportunities in sport and in coaching to be able to help people and see people grow and just the great value that uh, was behind that opportunity. Basketball immersion started for me because I was a little frustrated as a coach that people didn't seem to always share authentically what they actually were doing. Attending a lot of clinics, talking to a lot of coaches, buying DVDs, buying books. And I just felt like sometimes coaches didn't share authentically. So I started Basketball Immersion as just a way for me to share exactly what I did in my college practices. And it was unedited access to what we did. And from there I found uh, through my travels, particularly that people were very interested in more evidence-based coaching ideas, whether it's around skill acquisition, motor learning, sports psychology, et cetera, and uh, particularly with the games approach and decision-making, decision training. So those became the avenues where I got an opportunity to be able to grow. And that obviously led to not just basketball immersion, but also to the basketball podcast as well, where I got a chance to be able to have some of these conversations with coaches about what they do and to share the game. So just grateful for what, uh, what basketball immersion has become in the basketball podcast. And uh, I thank all of you who have supported it and uh, just tremendous to be able to be here, as I said, to be able to share the game. You, you do a lot of coach clinics uh, or you did for sure. Now it's harder with, with COVID-19. Um, 
also your podcast is worldwide known. You had a lot of guests or top coaches on it. What are two, three main big things you took from it? Or you, you, yeah, you took from it. From, from the podcast in particular, and, you know, even from traveling, like I, I haven't traveled obviously a lot this year, but last year I got the opportunity to be able to travel Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, some places like that. And, and the biggest takeaway is, is, is coming back to this psychological safety that this is shining through in the podcast in particular is how important it is for us as coaches to be able to create an, an environment for our players to feel safe and to feel value. And, uh, you know, starting with those questions of basically being able to answer every day for my players or for your players to be able to tell them that they belong, that they belong here and that I notice them improving. And that part of this, creating this environment for improvement, creating this environment where mistakes are okay and improvement is part of that process, that uh, we, it all starts from a psychological safety. So letting your players every day know that they belong and helping your players to understand that they are improving. Because I think if we reflect, especially on young people, but I think this applies for even professionals that have been around, they, the fun of basketball for them is not frivolous. It's the fun is improving, the fun is competing, and the fun is seeing themselves in, get better in some way, whether that's on the court or off the court and some things like that. So those things have really shone through, through my year of travel uh, last year. And then through the basketball podcast, just how consistently that message comes up in different ways, but the same message. Thanks a lot. So Chris, we can um, start with your part now. Perfect. If you, if you can share your screen and then. Perfect. Well, again, thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm, I'm here to share, I'm not here to sell. I'm here to be able to provide some ideas for you that hopefully stimulate your coaching. Uh, I, am, I am certainly someone who values evidence-based ideas and a lot of this stuff comes from uh, going back 25 years to my master's degree and then continuing my education through many sources about evidence-based ideas around skill acquisition and motor learning that apply to coaching. And uh, for me, the question that I always start with is, is there a better way? It's not, I'm not here to say anyone's wrong. You know, there's a lot of different ways to be able to approach the game and to be able to approach coaching. But constantly my challenge to people is just to be able to say, is there a better way? And I hope that something I share today will not only add value, but it will also stimulate your thinking about going, okay, is there a better way? I like my way better maybe, but is there a better way? And that's part of this process that I've gone through in terms of sharing the game. Now, for me, the evidence-based ideas, and I'm going to use lots of video and some examples here, but to me, the question mainly comes back to skills and decisions are interdependent, not independent. And too often, I feel as coaches, when we approach player development, we approach team development, we start from a perspective of skills and decisions being two separate things rather than the same thing. And to, for me, I classify them both as skill development, that both the technical and the tactical are part of skill development because you can't have one without the other. So we're going to get into when we use game-like offense versus defense drills with decisions, when we use drills, they're both player development and team development drills in my philosophy because you are coaching skills and decisions at the same time. And anytime you put offense versus defense, you can develop and coach both sides of the ball. And I'm going to share some examples of that as we go through this to be able to give you this concept. But basically, here's where I believe coaches, we have to consider this reality of skills and decisions being interdependent. And that it is really hard to use a simplified version, which we often do with drills, when we do on-air drills, meaning drills without defense or without decisions, and when we do it on air, without decisions, without defense, and when we use these simplified drills, 
then we expect players to be able to perform in games with completely different perceptual demands. And that's what I'm going to connect for you as I go through this is the perceptual side that we often don't connect with skill development. And perceptual demands are obviously a huge part of basketball. And if I was to phrase it for players, I would phrase it as this, that before we even get to skills and executing skills, the process of using a skill starts with perception, decision, skill execution. So skills are actually the third part of this. And if you think about how we often build players and we develop players is we start from skill, 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 rather than knowing that before we even get to skill and the execution of a skill in a game or a practice, it is preceded by perception and decision. The fourth part of that whole sequence is feedback. So there's some type of feedback on actually what happens. So keep that in mind as I go through this with the video is perception, decision, skill, and then feedback on what happens. So a very traditional, and I'll just give you some quick sn snippets here, but a very traditional mic and drill. Again, not here to say anything's wrong with it, but I will say it's limited in its ability to be able to develop a player. At some point, a drill like this becomes mindless, meaning it doesn't stimulate a player's mind anymore. And what we know about learning is in order for a player to learn, they must be challenged to retrieve information in their mind, in their brain. So we're trying to stimulate this mental retrieval process. And we're also trying to get it to the point that it sticks in their brain, this retention. So if I'm doing something where a player doesn't have to think, then I am not challenging the retrieval process and the retention process. So a player can get pretty good at this drill and become pretty mindless doing it over and over again because it doesn't have high task demands. It doesn't have any type of perception and decisions. It becomes something that is about comfort and confidence. And I'll come back to comfort and confidence because comfort and confidence are important. But a mic and drill is very limited in its ability to be able to develop players. We can make mic and drill more random, meaning it's less repetitive, but we're still getting these reps around the rim by doing what we would call random mic -in. So now wherever the ball lands, a player is going to shoot it. So there's no pattern. They're not following a pattern now. They're making this random. Wherever the ball lands, and we're not prescribing to them how they're going to finish. We're just saying, hey, wherever the ball lands, shoot it and score however you want. One foot, two foot, no rim, backboard, et cetera. That makes this more engaging because the player has to make decisions on their own. It's still not decision-making because there's no decisions, there's no defense, but it does increase somewhat the task demands. I'll get into an example later where we'll show you how we can add another level to this to make it more of that perception decision and then skill ex execution process. But that gives you a broad perspective on what I'm trying to stimulate you to think about, okay, are these drills doing what I think they're doing for my players? So what the science says is there, there's these practice orders that we use as coaches. And by and large, block practice means you repeat the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to do all right hand layups with no variation, all shoot 10 shots from the elbow. Serial means, which is the mic and drill is more of an example of serial where I'm going to do all A, all front layup, then all reverse layup, and then all two foot layup. And you go in this particular order. And then random means each time it's different. The player doesn't know what's coming. Now, why do we want to spend time in random when we're talking about player development and when we're talking about team development? Because the simplest way is that's how the game's played. The game's played in this random, unpredictable way. There's a lot of reasons for that. The main reason being that basketball is played in an open environment where we're playing against an opponent and we don't always know what the opponent's going to do. Even when we prepare at our best, there's always going to be decisions that have to be made based on what our opponent does. 
but there's also decisions based on what our teammates do. So that is a constant stimulation of this perception. I perceive what's happening in the game and then I make decisions based on that. So if we practice in a blocked way or even in a serial way, then we're not stimulating this perception action coupling, which is the scientific term for perception and decision and skill execution. We have a perception and then we have an action because of it. So we want to operate as much as possible in this random practice environment because of that. So I'll build on that concept for you. Back to block practice. So here's block practice. Repetitive shots over and over again from the same spot. Now, literature suggests this, and this is probably true, is that early in learning, there is value to blocked repetitions because we're helping a player become comfortable and confident with something. Later in learning, the value of block practices is that I'm building comfort and confidence. So if you saw an NBA player, for example, or a professional player, WNBA, overseas, wherever, if you saw a professional player work out before a game, do a pregame routine, it's probably the same routine over and over, and it's very repetitive. That is not learning. That is not learning. That is about comfort and confidence. That is about building their mindset to be able to play a game. So if I have a player that's struggling with something, I would want to sometimes reconnect them to the fact that they can do it. That would be, I go to block practice because I help connect them to, oh, okay, listen, you're not feeling very confident in your shooting? Here, let's go shoot 10 shots from dead on three point line and they make nine out of 10. And then you can walk away and say, wow, you can really shoot. What are you talking about? Why aren't you confident? So we're reconnecting things. Block practice, in my opinion, is mainly about that. Even with younger players, I am of the opinion now that hard first instruction has more value, meaning we first start in the context of the game. We first start with the complete. We throw them in the deep end maybe is the simplest way to see and to see if they can swim. And then from there, we build what we actually need to teach. Too often I feel as coaches, and I was certainly one of these coaches, we go in with a predetermined plan of what they need to learn rather than figuring it out based on how they're actually playing the game. So this is why, especially over the last, say, 10 years of my coaching career, we would almost start every practice with five on five. And the reason being is because it helped me evaluate more or it helped me confirm more what we needed to reconnect. What did we need to teach more of? What did we need to reteach? What are some things that we needed to do? And it's really hard to evaluate that in drills. Serial practice is, again, we would go in an order. I don't have an example here, but it'd be shoot a, shoot a shot, shoot a layup, shoot a pull up. Some type of order that you repeat over and over again. Random, we make this a little bit random here, because his feet are going to be different every time. We call this feet moving or dancing, and uh, they're doing some type of movement prior to shooting. Well, that makes it a little bit more random, but the question still comes back to you is, are we stimulating much in terms of perception and decision? They know they're gonna shoot prior to catching it. They know they're going to shoot prior to catching it. It means it's not game-like. Too often we think about game like as we've got to do something faster, like or we've got to do something out of our offense or out of our defense. So we've got to shoot a shot that happens in our offense. Let's say you do flare shooting. Okay, we're doing a game like drill. To me, that might be game speed. It might be a game action, but game like means there's decisions in my vocabulary. Game like means you make a decision prior to executing a skill. So if you're talking about doing game-like things in practice, it means there's decisions and the player doesn't have a predetermined outcome. And if we do drills on air without defense, then often players have this predetermined outcome. He knows he's gonna shoot, so he doesn't have to think. So we can make it more engaging and I'll get into BDT shooting in a second, but we can make it more engaging in different ways. Now, here's my philosophy generally with player development. 
I believe that player development should be more player led. Now as coaches at whatever age you coach at, it's part of our responsibility to not motivate players, but to create an environment for them to be motivated. So I think about it this way. If I can, every day my players show up at practice and I notice them, I acknowledge them, I tell them they belong, I tell them that they're getting better, then I'm creating an environment where they can be motivated. They feel like there's value to their practice. And how many times as a coach do you notice progress? Big things or little things, you notice progress that the player gains motivation from. That's what I mean by a coach-led environment that creates motivation. To me, the main value of that is that now I can connect that to a player-led development system, which is, hey, listen, Megan, you couldn't do this last practice. You can do it this practice. Now, how about you go home and you try this? See if you can come back next practice and do this, or see if you spend more time on this if it gets more comfortable. How many times do we stimulate our players to be able to say, go home and work on things that they can get better at? Well, obviously there's some limitations. They might not have access to a hoop. They don't have access to a gym, et cetera, et cetera. Let's, let's just stay in this utopia right now that they have access. But regardless, we want to stimulate them leading themselves to be able to improve. All the best players that you've ever coached are the best players because they've spent more time developing on their own. There's no question about it. It's not all coach-led development. Even though we have all these trainers nowadays and we have these great club systems and these great development models, the best players still spend time on the game alone. For me, layups on air, mixed drills, which is some combination of dribbling and shooting, say they go three times between their legs and they shoot the ball. Ball handling on air, you see two balls stationary or two ball dribbling or something like that, or one ball dribbling. Shooting, so getting like 100 reps on their own, say one on old ball screen. All that stuff is something that I want to stimulate my players to do on their own. For me, practice, when a coach is present, is about perception and decisions. If I have an opportunity to be able to coach my players in a team setting where there's other players there, then I want to always be coaching perception and decision. So an example would be instead of doing one on O, I'm going to do a whole practice of one on one because they're going to get value from the fact now I can coach not just their skills, but I can coach their decisions. So to me, team practice or coach led practice is about connecting perception and decision rather than a lot of these on air things or a lot of these mass repetition things. Those should be things that hopefully we stimulate. Now, again, practice time access. For me, my players come in before practice, come in or stay later after practice. Those are times where they can get mass shots. Those are times where they can do their mass dribbling, whatever it may be. But in practice, I was going to coach the game while they played the game. This is an example. To me, if I come to practice and I, and I spend my time, again, there's nothing wrong with this. Let me be clear. I want my players to do this. I just want my players to do this on their own time. Because if I'm coming to practice and organizing this, then I'm taking opportunities away from connecting what I feel is the really hard part for players. And that's connecting the skill to the decision to the game application. So to me, this is something a player should be doing on their own. Whether you prescribe that or you help them develop that, which is probably the case in a lot of ways, that's player-led development. This is a little bit, it's just a pattern, by the way. He's just doing a pattern. The first one is blocked. Same thing over and over. This is a little more serial. It's a pattern, right? To me, awesome. I want my players to do that as much as possible on their own time, right? And I'll load them with challenge and add different things to it to make it more difficult, but that's player-led development. The value for me as a coach is connecting, as I said, perception. So I'll give you an example, building on the mic and drill that I showed you earlier, and now say, okay, this is something that I actually would spend time on in a coach-led practice. 
And the reason being is that I'm going to have distracting information present and visual stimuli. Distracting information in basketball games is provided by the defense or your teammates. Hopefully not as a, no, hopefully not as coaches. We don't want to provide distracting information. Parents, we don't want them to be distracting information. We want our players to be able to make perception and decisions based on, again, their teammate or their opponents. The visual stimuli is a thing. What should they actually be seeing from those things? And then I'll talk about connect and transfer and figure it out. So this is what perceptual layups will become, and I'll show you that. As a building block here, I started from this. My daughter, before I taught her anything, few things happen. One is I said, everything we're going to do is end in, is going to end in a shot. To me, I'm like thinking back to basketball practice and then having literally coached tens and thousands of kids through summer camps over the last 20 years. The one thing I know is players love to shoot. So to do anything in a basketball practice that doesn't end in a shot, and especially when we're talking about player development, we're taking away from an opportunity for a player to fall in love with practice to fall in love with development. So if we did a pivoting drill in space where they take two dribbles, they jump stop, they pivot, they pass back to their partner and they never shoot. I think that's taking away an opportunity for a player to be able to enjoy practice and enjoyment in practice. Even I think enjoyment in practice is offense versus defense. But if you're not going to go there, then you're at least going to go to the fact that after every repetition, they're going to shoot. They're going to shoot. So we just did pivoting here. I'll reverse and let you watch it. We just did pivoting to a shot. Every time, just pivot, shoot. Whole bunch of progressions. The first one would be, I teach her by saying, okay, left foot, front pivot, right foot, reverse pivot. All of you would have done something like that before in coaching your players. We pro pro progress that as much as possible and say, okay, now you're going to move to the ball. You're not going to catch it stationary. You're going to move to the ball, move to the ball, catch it. And now she has to figure it out. She shoots. It's painful to watch, isn't it? Like I am showing you right now, her struggling. And this is the norm. I think, again, we have a false representation on social media with all these trainers showing us constantly perfect reps, right? basketball immersion i started it to show you imperfect man you'll see my players and you'll see my daughter in this example just look awful like she looks bad doing this and that's cool because here's the other most important part of this for me as a dad and as a coach in this example let's just consider me as a coach i want to normalize struggle i want to make struggle normal for her i want to make not being good and just being okay Okay, getting better, but you're still not good yet. I want to normalize that process for her that she understands that she doesn't start from great. She starts from bad and then she gets better. And that's a part of this process in showing this. This is what it looks like. And now we added a dribble, jump stop, figure it out. Boom. So I'm not going to get into mechanical guidance and stuff like that too much here, but an example would be here. Okay, she's doing on-air dribbling reps. Perfect. I gave her a hula hoop, so it gives her a representation. To me, this is player-led development. This isn't me. Now, I prescribed it for her initially. After that, we've never done this again. She may do it on her own. She may not. I don't know. But I can now tell her to use, okay, let's dribble outside your body and inside your body. Do an inside-outside dribble. Boom. And she has some representation of that in her mind. Now, what we want to do as quick as possible is remove the guidance. So now she doesn't have that guidance. If I have the pylon there, if I have the hula hoop there, if I have the you know person standing there, then she doesn't necessarily get the full task demand of what it's going to be. So we want to remove guidance in that way. So connecting these things now, remembering back to this, no decision, no perception, just following a prescribed pattern. Cool. Do it on your own. Do it on your own. But my time as a coach, I want to progress this beyond random and into game-like. 
And game like is this, where now there's a decision. This is on YouTube, on Basketball Immersion's YouTube. It's called uh, Perceptual Layups, Perceptual Layups. And all we're going to do here, I'll let you watch and then I'll describe it. It may not seem like much, but people ask me all the time, how can I help my son or daughter become more confident? Well, the number one thing about confidence is become more skilled. How do you help anyone become more confident? You help them become more skilled. All right. How do I help my son or daughter become more confident in the game? Well, we got to connect the skill to the decision, right? The thing is, you can be the most skilled player in the world, but if you don't know how to apply it or when to apply it, then you're still going to struggle. And that's where we want to connect things. So to me, this perceptual layups is this. Let's just talk about the drill first. They move at the same time. So they move at the same time toward each other. The defender, their responsibility is to step forward and then step to a side, their choice. We call it step, step, stand. Step forward, step to a side, stand there. All they're doing right now, and this would be a representation of some type of guided practice because they're not live. All they're trying to do is provide distracting information and visual stimuli. So they're just trying to distract the offensive player. Well, why are we trying to distract the offensive player? I'll connect that for you in a second. Before they shoot the layup, and if we just did a layup on air, Mike and layup on air, this offensive player, their only perception and decision is based on their location to the basket, right? Shooting a layup without defense, the only thing I have to focus on is the layup. But the reality of shooting layups in a game, and this is one of the reasons I think we don't develop necessarily players' ability to finish as well as possible around the basket, is because in a game, almost 100% of the time before you shoot a layup, you first have perception and decisions based on teammates or opponents. So you are distracted before you even get to look at the rim. So we have these perception action processes that happen. So to me, perceptual layups is trying to connect the fact that before you finish, you first have to make a decision relative to, in this example, a defender. So right now, their first visual stimuli is which way did the defender step. Even if they aren't in their path, they still are distracted by the defender. Their second perceptual and decision process is based on where are they relative to the basket based on that. So if we want players to be able to finish better, we should stimulate the process that happens when they shoot a layup in a game. And that means they're distracted. Now, this is a progression. A better way to do this is obviously one-on-one -on -one with some type of constraint. Constraints are things that shape learning, but an example of a constraint would be that we start with the defender on their side and they go in for a layup with the defender on their side. They still have the advantage, they go in and shoot a layup. It's one-on-one, -on -one, but it's live. So that becomes more of a live finishing drill. But shooting on air layups, in my opinion, is very limited, very limited. Now, you might say, okay, we've got to start from a foundation of teaching six different scoring moves, six different layups, six different finishing moves. Okay, that's fine. I would argue in that example, even, do I care how my players score or do I care that they made the right decision to shoot? If they make the right decision to shoot more often than not, their percentage likelihood of scoring is going to go up. So for me, I don't care what type of layup they shoot. At, at no point in a game have I stopped a player and said, hey, listen, you should have done move number three in my daily dozen, right? What I would have said is, hey, listen, I thought you probably shouldn't have shot that shot because of this. Or what did you see that made you think you should have shot that shot? So to me, the decision is more important than the skill 
in the sense that if we want to improve their finishing around the rim, we should be focusing on should they have shot it or not. We refer to those as open versus closed windows. And we try to explain to players the difference between an open window and a closed window. Now, there are always exceptions. If you're coaching an unreal player, you know, a James Harden-like talent, then, you know, their shot's going to be better than someone else's shot generally, no matter what. We're talking about just, again, in terms of development, we're trying to get players to understand an open window. So what's an open window? If they shot it right now between the defender, the defenders between them and the basket, that's a closed window. So we want them to be able to find an open window, right? And obviously in this example, kind of a Euro step layup. I never taught a Euro step layup. I've never taught a Euro step layup to my daughter. But when we do this, she's figured it out on her own that if I'm going to go step forward right now, I'm not going to have an open window. But if I take a step to the side, I'm going to have the open window. So that she evolved this understanding of shooting shots, right, in these open windows. So we spend tons of time on that. Here's a game example. Before LeBron shoots the layup, the first thing he has to do is make a perception and decision based on the defender, right? Like he can't just stare at the rim right now. He's got to decide what he's going to do relative to this defender. You know, this is second line of help. It could be first line of help. But based on that perception of defender, decision relative to the defender, and then even after making that decision, now he's got a closed window here, but he's LeBron, so it's all good. But he's still now got to make a perception and decision relative to his position to the basket. So to me, that's an application of perception, action, coupling, and in the example I just showed you, perceptual labs. So as we increase randomness, as we increase decision-making, we increase retention. We increase the retention because that mainly relates to the fact that a player has to think more. We engage them in thinking. It's less mindless and it's more decision-making Then we increase their thinking. And that obviously, anytime we do that, we're going to increase the mess. We're going to increase the unpredictability of that. So that is a thing. So to me, I'm going to get into this, but I'll also give you the link when I'm done. You can learn more about basketball decision training, shooting. And this is an example of that. So if we connect back to that example of the player shooting shots over and over again from the same spot, you don't always want to go offense versus defense. But in this example, we want to bridge on air with live decision making on air with live decision making so we don't want to go right to one-on-one -on -one. we want to get a bunch of reps but we want to connect the decision to the skill basketball decision training shooting allows you to do that so watch the passer every time they pass they will give a cue So in simplest terms here, this player is simulating somewhat what a defender would do. And our shoot or drive decision is arm length. So if a player, a defender is arm length away, then you're not a shooter, you're a driver. And if the defender is more than arm length away, then we want you to shoot. So we're trying to connect that to this shooting situation. Instead of doing it on air where they know they're gonna shoot, Every time they catch the ball, they have to make a decision prior to executing the skill. So we're connecting perception, decision, and skill execution. So if they pass right now and my hands are out, then the offensive player passes the ball. If their hands are down, then they shoot the ball. It gets a little more evolved. There's a, there's a whole bunch of decisions. You're going to see her step towards here and actually make her pass and cut. The general rule again is if you use on air repetitive drills, we want to increase random and messy. We can do that by adding some type of basketball decision training. We want to mix to increase retrieval and retention. That means we want to mix all things together and not just have one thing trained in isolation. 
And then we want to evolve it as fast as possible. If we're just talking about player development, they want to evolve it to one-on-one. -on -one. If we're talking about team development, obviously two and two, three and three, four and four, et cetera. So in this example, here's a young player, feet moving. Every time they catch the ball, we're in a skill development focus here. We want them to fight for their feet. But before they worry about skill execution, meaning they're going to shoot or pass in this simple example, they have to first perceive based on their passer who's simulating a defender, whether they should be passing it or shooting it. So it's training them to be aware of this distracting information and visual stimuli. And that's what BDT shooting is all about. And I will provide a link to be able to learn more for free. This is Eastern Michigan division one team in the United States and their players doing BDT shooting too. The other read that I hadn't given you yet is that when this player steps towards them, it makes them drive the ball. So it stimulates them to drive the ball. So again, instead of just doing constant mindless reps of shooting before they shoot, they have to first perceive, oh, hands down, shoot, hands up, pass, step towards drive. Now this can get to a really high level here and I'll show you two more videos before we get to questions. This is called shoulder game, BDT basketball decision training shooting and shoulder game are both for free on my YouTube channel. And you can see this, but now we're starting with the defender arm length away. So instead of having this space, we're going to start simulating what a defender would be like a good defender in a game would be arm length away. So right now, if you just look at this example here, if this player jumps backwards or we could, we evolve it to if they just drop their hands, that would stimulate the decision to shoot. So we're working on skills. We're working on fighting for your feet. That means getting your feet to the ground, prepared to shoot. We're working on ball pickup, the ability to pick up the ball at the dribble. And we're working on shooting, but we're working on the, all those things, connecting it to the decisions that would cue that skill execution in a game. So in this example, shoot. In the next example, drive step towards them, make some drive. Now, beautiful thing about this is I can still use all of my coaching interventions that I would normally use. I could stop this player, hold, recreate, let's go back. I could ask a question and I can stimulate them in the learning process because you're going to see here, he's going to take a dribble, not towards the rim. So meaning he didn't execute this push out dribble very well. So he went wide. What do we want them to do? We want to go, uh, we call it a swim. Some people call it jail, different things like that. But we want to be able to coach the game while they're playing the game. That means coach it in the context of perception and decision. This is next level BDT, next level basketball decision training. So you'll see how free, again, you don't start here, you get here. But you'll see they're having fun. They put in a bunch, a bunch of different decisions, the drive and kick. And now it becomes, instead of just mindless reps, every repetition is preceded by perception and decision. And that's ultimately what we want to do with players is to be able to engage them in the learning process. So reviewing player-led development is anything that's void of decision-making. Coach-led development for me, coach-led development for me is engaging players in the decision process. I'm there to help them get better. They get better through coaching interventions. That's me asking questions. That's me creating an environment where they struggle and they have to figure out what to do. And it's those different things that come with it. So to me, all these things happen. And this is just the general summary. Uh, with someone is basketball decision training. So there's decisions or could be guided in that progression of what perceptual layups I showed you or live. And then on your own, you saw already in terms of that. So cool. We don't need to see that. But uh, for me right now, uh, I want to be a resource to be able to answer any and all questions and to be able to help you. Uh, I will post a few links in there so that you can get direct to some of these answers that I've talked about here as well. I will also tell you, I already posted my uh, Twitter. If you're on Twitter, uh, I post it. The main reason I'll repost it there is my DMs are open. So if you have questions that we don't get to here and you have questions 
then you can DM me on Twitter and we'll get to those questions there as well. But uh, thank you, Marcus and Rajan, and, and I'm happy to engage in any and all questions. So we have a first question for, from Rabia. I tried to put it on. One sec. I got a Razvan. Okay. Rabia. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Chris. Nice to meet Hello. you. Great um, to meet you. I have a question in regards to the um, what you said earlier that for you it's more important that your player um, can do a layup um, or does decides which layup he wants to do in a, in a game like situation or in the game instead of knowing like six different layup versions or types of layups. But my question is, isn't it important to show them at least what is possible so that they have an idea of what they can choose in a specific situation? So what I saw in the past is because I'm, I'm, t I'm, I'm coaching girls in an like beginner level, <laughs> not professional. So often they haven't seen anything or they don't know what it's possible. And then I have to show them and sometimes let them do the, the, the drills so that they can understand what, what foot do they have to use and what hand do they have to use or how they have to spin or whatever. So that, and then eventually they can use it in the game. So I think it's difficult for especially beginners if, if they don't have even a clue on what is possible in the game. So awesome question an awesome connection of what I'm talking about. So here's how I would frame it for your girls or for other players in this exact scenario. Number one, I would put them in a situation where they would struggle and have to figure it out. So maybe we do perceptual layups first. And then what I would do is then I would talk about the possibilities after. So instead of starting from the six finishing moves, or the possibilities, by the way, I love that word. And I'm so glad you used it because I believe that basketball is about possibilities. It's not about absolutes. And too often as coaches, we make things about absolutes that you have to do this. And that's what I'm trying to explain with, with an extreme example, maybe, but we would throw them in the deep end. So we would start with perceptual layups, or we would start with one-on-one. -on -one. They would struggle, but through that struggle now, they've connected the fact that now I can go, okay, here is a possible finishing move. Here is a possible finish move. Here's another possible finish move. Which one do you think would work best in this scenario, or which one is the best decision? And we can connect them. And then, yes, of course, we want them to spend time on developing these finishing moves. What I am suggesting is your initial learning phase, you have to teach them. But once we've taught them, we probably care too much as coaches which one they use rather than did they make the right decision. So I'm agreeing with you. I'm only saying that I would start, let me give you pivoting as an example. Never having taught pivoting to any player, if I'm in a team practice, let's say eight-year-old girls, I would start with three-on-three -three dead. Three-on-three -three dead. So, okay, I'm going to throw it to a player and they cannot dribble. They're dead. Every other player has to figure out what to do, et cetera. I'm not even going to tell them anything other than that. Now, they're going to struggle. It's going to be ugly. But the idea being that now once they've experienced that, if I go teach pivoting or I go teach cutting off the ball, they have a connection for understanding the skill part of what I'm teaching because it's now connected to the perception of the decision. So do you, so do you give them – Afterwards, if you if you let them play for a few minutes, like you explained, so do you give them afterwards a kind of a solution? Um, or because I can imagine that if 
you don't give them a solution on what, how they can pivot um, in this example, then it might be super frustrating if there are some players that are not as fast learning as others. And if they don't get the clue of, oh, I have to pivot this way or I have to turn or if I can do things with the ball um, while I'm pivoting, something like that. I love it. This is, this is, so yes. Do we give them solutions? So I would try to never give them a solution. I would try and give them solutions, but your point is absolutely on, on par with what I'm saying. And that is for young players, we might only give them two possibilities for players. As they improve, they might have three possibilities. For really skilled players, anything's possible. But we wouldn't start from, there's six solutions. We would start from, here's two solutions. So absolutely. So can we develop those younger players or those players that struggle with just two? Well, yes, we can. We hope, right? Some of your players who are faster learners may get to three solutions and four solutions quicker. That doesn't mean everyone needs to be at three or four solutions. Some players stay at two solutions. And for anyone that's coached a higher level where you deal with some players that are more skilled than others, for sure, it's just that comes back to roles and role definition a little bit. We don't want to define roles for younger players. We want to give them more or less in terms of solutions in their toolkit. Okay, thank you. Great question. Thank you. We have another one, Maxi. You should be on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks of all first um, that you take the time to talk with us. Um, my question is game like uh, when I go to dribbling moves, um, often we teach like do a cross between behind and that stuff and do 20 rep repetitions. And you talk about game like so. Do you just put a player in a situation one versus one and let them figure out what kind of dribbling moves um, do you can find to score? Um, do you can find to beat your man? Or so, like, do you first put them in and do webs after, or you don't do webs at all? Yeah. So. It's again, this build this is a great question because it builds on what we just talked about. So I just did a clinic and I am a hundred percent behind this that I believe player development. I could build a player from scratch by just playing one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. I, I really do. I think a player would improve better in the long run. Now they would, there'd be tons of struggle early, but part of our job as coaches is to normalize struggle and to provide coping strategies for that struggle. Because isn't that life? Like really coping strategies are a part of life. How do you deal with struggle? How do you deal with not being the best player? How do you deal with these different things? So one-on-one -on -one can help do that. And in Max's question, one-on-one -on -one with constraints, meaning, listen, I, I'm not a dribble limit person. I'm a direction limit person. I would say, okay, you cannot take two, like for younger players, you cannot take three dribbles in a direction, not towards the rim. You cannot take three dribbles on the spot. Right. We would say if you take a third dribble on the spot, you lose the ball. So that would be an example of using a constraint to help shape their possibilities. OK, so now they know they have to go somewhere. They have to go forward, but they can go laterally. They can go forward. They can go backwards. They can go these different directions. And to Max's question, that I believe is the number one problem in teaching dribbling is that we teach dribbling from a stationary spot rather than dribbling as a footwork drill. Dribbling is a footwork drill. Above all else, dribbling is all about footwork. The ball just happens to come with you. So to teach players how to, especially young players, the number one problem for most young players is that they get in trouble with their dribble and don't know what to do when they're in trouble with their dribble. So learning how to backwards dribble when you get in trouble learning how to continue a Nash dribble under the basket, learning how to dribble and pivot out of problems, different things like that. So to me, it's really hard to develop that if it's on air. So 
one on O dribbling on the spot in the examples Max gave. Yeah, I want them to do that, but I want them to do that on their own because you know what that builds? That builds comfort and confidence. Every single thing that they see on Instagram that they say, that's really cool. That train, oh my gosh, I want to try that. I'm like, go do that. I'm just not doing that in practice. Go do that and show me you can do that. But look, in practice, we're going to work on attack and counter, attack and counter, attack and get out of trouble, attack and get out of trouble. So different types of, I call them protection plans. What dribble moves do you teach your players when they're in trouble? Right? Because we know it's not always straight lines. So attack and counter is attack in one direction, counter another direction. That means attack and crossover, attack in between your legs, attack and behind your back. Well, attack and protection plan means attack and take a backwards dribble to create space to get out of trouble. So that's where I believe we can do that. Now we can do that in space. It doesn't have to be one-on-one -on -one to a score. It can be one-on-one -on -one versus defender. But to me, that's the value of that. Uh, and in basketball immersion, people that are members, I know there's a few here. We have some things that are called kill the grass and steal the ball. And I'll, I'll share really simple here. Steal the ball is literally just that. Max dribbles and I try and steal the ball from him, but we confine him to a really small space. To me, that develops this dribbling concept better than anything because I have distracting information and visual stimuli that I have to focus on. Thanks very much. Great question. Next one, Simon, do you want? Yes, hi, Chris, uh, thanks for being here. Um, I have a question of how you um, implement um, the, the, the separations between player-led practice and coaches-led practice. So is there any kind of, of pattern that you use every season from, from the, from the, right from the get-go um, that you give the players like stuff that they can do when, this, when there's players-led um, practice instead of coach, coach, coaches led practice. So is there anything like that you can give us how you implement this with, with your teams in, in the summer, for example, so that the players know, because I know that most of I, me as a kid, I was a visual learner. So when I looked at the videos, for example, I was, I was always trying to repeat that, like the, the Iverson pass or, or whatever, I don't know. And, and today when I show videos to the kids, do you do that too? Like, do you show them videos on tell them, Hey, repeat that or, or try to make the two. Absolutely. So we, we are in the greatest learning generation of all time because of YouTube, because of Instagram, because of all these platforms. Like if we use this, and I think the pandemic has helped us as coaches understand how to deliver video to players in a way that they now imitate it. All of that is a part of player led development. We, we can't expect players to just know how to lead themselves. We have to teach them how to lead themselves. So absolutely create a team Facebook group that's private for your team, deliver a video every day and say, hey, next practice, who can do this best? And then come in the next practice and notice who does it well. You know what you'll also notice? Who doesn't do it well? Who didn't even try it? who didn't even put effort into it. That's just as important. And we don't want to call them out. We don't want to embarrass them. But at the same time, we have to have those private conversations. And I believe all development to a certain extent comes from many conversations, right? It's not these big speeches we give to the team. It's these little mini conversations where, you know, I take Marcus aside and say, hey, listen, I noticed you weren't very good with this. How much time did you put into it? Oh, okay. So you're okay not being comfortable and confident. You're okay not being as skilled as other people. Look, I don't feel bad for players that aren't as skilled as other players because generally they're not as skilled because they don't work as hard on becoming skilled. Now, sometimes there's early maturers, there's late maturers, there's tallers, there's shorters. Yes, I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about actual skill of, say, dribbling. Someone's a better dribbler than someone else because they spent more time dribbling. And that needs to be acknowledged and that needs to be vocalized to the group. And if you normalize that, then it becomes very clear when you send things home or you connect players through video, why someone's better than someone else. 
And that to me, back to this question, is the best part about building player-led development. My, my, um, my coaches way back when used to send home homework. They just called it homework. Okay, who could come back and go three times between their legs? Okay, who can juggle a tennis ball and dribble? And he wasn't spending practice time on that, but he showed it to us and he said, who can do that best next practice? That stuck with me. Because you know what? I was the player that went home and did it. And what I didn't, I didn't understand, and I still sometimes don't, why other players didn't? Why other players didn't? And then they come and then they complain about playing time or they complain about not being good. I'm like, because you didn't, you didn't practice. You didn't get better. So those are the moments where I think we can really help players is connecting those things. So use video, absolutely. Find it and you can go on Instagram, follow almost any trainer in the world and you'll get a good video that you can send them. Say, hey, do this. Who can do this? Great, cool. But I'm not spending my practice time on that. I'm gonna spend our practice time on how do you get out of trouble when you're dribbling and how do your teammates help you get out of trouble when you're dribbling, that type of thing. France has a question. France. Servus. That was fun. How we say in Bavaria. Uh, I just wanted to ask, how do you see the role of you as a coach in a player development culture? So, again, I, it may sound repetitive, but I think the, the problem has been this Hollywood or media portrayal of what a coach is. That, that our hardest problem as coaches is trying to live up to what a parent's perception of a coach is, what the media's perception of a coach is, and to a certain extent, what an administrator or fellow coach's perception of what a coach is. And, and I, in, in my opinion, am someone who is there to create an environment for learning to happen. But I am not the number one reason learning happens. I want to empower my players to be learners. I want to create an environment for them to be learners. And part of that is creating an environment where struggle is okay. And learning how to figure things out is okay. Now, going back to that first question, my role as a coach is to share possibilities, to provide solutions, to provide ideas. But I think too often a coaches, our role has been to give absolutes. If A happens, you've got to do B or else you're wrong and you run. <laughs> you're, wrong, you're wrong and you don't play. You know what? How about if A happens, you can do A or B in response. And you know what? I'm just looking at names here. But Megan, she really likes between the legs as a dribble. Whereas Lorenzo, he likes behind the back as a dribble. Am I going to say, Lorenzo, you can only do between the legs or you're wrong? No, I'm going to say that's her best solution and that's his best solution. And it's my job as a coach to help players understand what their best solution to a problem is because it's not all the same, right? And I already alluded to that, that for, for players, some of them are going to have the ability to have all three solutions, but some can only have one solution to start. And that's the individualization of learning, the specificity of learning. That's the reality. I mean, the unskilled player or the worst player, right? They may only be able to have one solution, but we're going to work on that second solution. They just may not be able to use it yet, right? Whereas that player that has three solutions, my job is to help them either understand how to add a fourth solution, or here's how I view my other role as a player development coach. My role as a player development coach is all not just to add things, it's to help players to remove things. And I think too often we think about skill development as the addition of something. I want you to think about skill development as also the removal of something. So think about this. If a player needs three dribbles from the three point line to go in for a layup and we get them down to two dribbles, they didn't add anything, they removed something. But to me, they become more efficient and they become more effective. And that is my job as a player development coach is to help them become more efficient and effective with what they do. And I think too often we just think about skill as the addition, the addition, the addition. You can't do this. Now we add this. You, okay, you can do this. Now let's add this. Now, sometimes it's just, hey, 
you don't need to step to pass. So we're going to get you to the point where you don't have to step to pass. Right. And some of that is physiological skill, like in terms of their maturation, but some of it is just understanding, Hey, you don't need to step here and you'll be faster and more efficient passing and less likely to get the ball stolen because you don't have to that type of thing. So I know that's a long answer, but, uh, I am there to help players to figure things out is really my short answer rather than to always just tell them the solution. Sorry. And I should add this, the art of it is I have to balance that with building their comfort and confidence, which for all of I'm saying right now is I still have to build their comfort and confidence. And that means there's some times where I have to be able to do things where they don't struggle. I have to do things where they start to feel like they're figuring it out. Right. And that could be through video or that could be through practice, but it can't be all struggle there. I'm not saying that I'm approaching it a little bit from an extreme, but I have to balance that with comfort and confidence. I have also a question. We talked a lot about, about player development and a lot about uh, the, the, the things we can find on, on YouTube, on Facebook or anything, whatever. Um, what about coach development? What methods, tools um, for, for them, for coaches, do you find, find most useful? So like clinics, workshops, online tools? Well, I'm biased. I'm going to tell you to join Basketball Immersion and join our community. And I can, I can guarantee you that you will, you will improve as a coach. I mean, not just through the things that I share, but through uh, what, what other coaches in the community share as well in terms of the interactions. But you will be stimulated in the way that we approach things in the way that we coach. Uh, in, in separate from that, I was having a conversation with Marcus and Razan before. I, I believe that the conversations, it's the same thing for you as coaches. Watching a clinic video and watching things on Twitter and following my Twitter, for example, all those are good. But really where I'm going to improve is after I watch this clinic or I spend time with this clinic where say now Megan and Max are able to have a conversation about the things that I said. If they have a conversation about the things that I say and they say, listen, I think he was full of crap or I liked it or I didn't like it, whatever it is, that's where we improve, I feel, as coaches. And that's what we're lacking in these Zoom clinics is that ability to be able to talk after the clinic over a beverage maybe, or just in the gym and be able to have these little mini conversations about these different things. So I would encourage you to find a group. It could be a peer group. It could be a mentor, but there's people to be able to have conversations with about things that you learn and say, hey, listen, what do you think about this? Because they stimulate you in different ways. And I do believe that that's a huge part about coach development that unfortunately we're missing out of because of the lack of travel and the lack of in-person clinics. Saying that, the best place I had to do that is I had opportunities to be able to run summer camps. So uh, Megan Wood, who's here, for example, I had a chance to talk to her and she can come up to me or I can come up to her and I can ask her what she thinks, right? Those places, where else do you do that? Not just in summer camps, not just in clinics, but attending practices. So attend your, don't just think about attending practices as attending, you know, Bayern Munich's practice. Think about it as in terms of attending one of your peers practices and being able to have conversations with them after practice about what they did and hopefully being open-minded enough with each other that you can disagree. Because I think that's another hard thing in coaching is that we always have to agree with each other in person because we're very sensitive, right? We're very, you know, and again, we have all of us, me as well, we have our ego invested, right? But I'm actually at the point now where I'm okay if you tell me I'm wrong and you don't like what I do, that's cool. Because to me, that means we've stimulated something because at least you've thought about it, right? And that's part of this as well. So that's such a good question. And it's, uh, you know, I can't wait till I travel to Germany and we could all have beer together and talk about this live. So that'd be more fun. Great. Marcus, you had one? Thank you. Actually, there's a couple more. Um, Martin's got one. So Martin, you should be able to put your mic on.
doesn't seem to be working. I'll read the question for you, Chris. Um, he's asking, which is the best way to improve all players in a team, especially if every player is on a different skill level, for example, layups or shooting? So how do you deal with a heterogeneous yeah. group? So team practice, I'm going to tell you, is play offense versus defense. So in that example, if you're talking about working on layups, then play one-on-one. -on -one. Play one-on-one -on -one where the offense has the advantage or the offense has the disadvantage. And now, and, there, and there's multiple, if you go on, uh, on, on my YouTube channel, there's something called angle layups where you can get an example of a player having an advantage going in for a layup uh, and different things like that where they get a chance to be able to experience it. But the main thing about that is, again, that they don't play against the same player all the time, right? And that's the hard thing with diverse learners is that, you know, you're going to have a, the best and you're going to have the worst and you've got to make sure that you balance that. That doesn't mean the best shouldn't go against the worst and the worst shouldn't go against the best, but it should be a balance of all those different things. And that's where we would do something, say King's Court, if you know what that is, where it's like, you know, you play to two at a basket. Once a player gets to two, then everyone rotates up or down based on whether you say won or lost, whatever that may be. Uh, by the way, another advantage of one-on-one, -on -one, in my opinion, is normalizing winning and losing. And to me, winning and losing is something we should be teaching, you know, and not in the sense that, hey, listen, it, it's the most important thing to win, but in the sense that, hey, you're going to win and you're going to lose. That's, that's normal. But the value of that is like, say you're down, say we have a scrimmage and a team's up seven to nothing, seven, seven to one, let's say. I would stop that scrimmage and say, listen, you're not going to win, but can you get within three points in the next four minutes? And think about that. Think about that competitively and say, there's a competitive mindset. Look, you're not going to win, but can you get within three points? If you get within three points, that is a type of competitive victory. And we only equate winning and losing with winning rather than competing. Competing is, did you make it closer? Did you make it competitive? Right? Is there a way that, you, you know, look, sometimes you're just going to lose. But what did we do to compete? You know, those different things. So that would be it. And then the other part of that is uh, we would play a lot of offense versus defense. Uh, at the college level, we played almost five on five for a whole practice, for, for the whole practice. You know, at the younger levels, a lot more three on three, more touches, more scenarios, but just more opportunities for them to be able to be in offense versus defense situations. The one exception, because I saw you wrote shooting coaches, shooting is the one skill which requires isolated development, meaning isolated coach athlete development. And that is a challenge because you know that that's hard to do in your team practice situations but you need to spend time one-on-one -on -one with players in shooting development in some context if we really want to get them to that next level. That doesn't mean one-on, you know, coach every day working on shooting with one player, but it means every day I, I get some connection with my players in terms of shooting, uh, ideally. But uh, look, I understand the reality is you don't practice five times a week. You don't practice seven times a week. You might only have two practices a week, right? So I'm trying to think what are the things that are going to help my players be able to enjoy the game more. That means get more skilled so they enjoy the game more and help our team compete. That's it. And I don't think two ball dribbling helps them do that, right? That's my main point here is what actually helps them do that is three on three, dribble, two dribbles, dead, figure out how to get out of trouble and play live from there, right? Something like that. Okay, we have another question from Maxi Donat. Maxi, off you go. Yeah, again. So um, I coach a lot of under 12 boys and girls. And my question is, when I do the game-like teaching, so let the players figure out the moves, the dribbling moves and the finishing moves and don't teach them. So you earlier said that your daughter um, figured out to use the Eurostep um, expect you didn't teach it um, but um, there are a lot of coaches that are afraid of travels um, or not winning in the under 14 um, level so when I let the players figure out in the under 12 they are so like um, 
a player comes to me and can't even do a euro step, can't even do an inside finish and that stuff. And how? What's your opinion about that? So, or what's your? I, I missed the word. Uh, <laughs> Philosophy. Yeah. Shit. Uh, yeah. Experience. Experience. Yeah. Thanks. Well, uh, one, it, one, it's hard and and it sucks, right? Like yeah. it really does. Like if look, if a youth coach really wants to win. And again, I'm not talking about, I don't know what the rules are in Germany for under 12, but if a youth coach in America wants to win, they're going to play zone and they're going to just isolate their best player or they're going to press, right? We know that that's the, you're going to win if you have a player that's better than anyone else and you just let them go one-on-one -on -one and play and you play zone or you press because we know what youth players struggle with, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an administrative problem. To me, I would focus more on reverse engineering that and saying, okay, if I know what young players struggle with, then I'm going to design every practice behind how can they handle pressure? How can they attack closeouts? Because that to me is attacking a zone, is driving the zone and attacking a zone because we know zones even at the youth level are pretty bad. And we tend to be pass, pass, pass oriented rather than drive oriented against zones. And then work on this other piece, which is comfort and comfort, comfort and confidence with the ball, ball skills. I believe shooting is a post pubescent skill. Now I'm not saying don't teach it at the younger levels, but I think we overrate the value of shooting from the perimeter for under 14, under 13, under 12, depending on when maturation is. Mm -hmm. What really matters at that age is learning how to finish around the basket. So if we can develop the ability to have different solutions on layups and scoring around the basket, or again, being able to pass from the basket out, then I believe we do a better service for a player in the long run. Now, my experience is it sucks. If I'm going to just focus on player development and I'm going to play against a coach who's only going to care about winning. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not fun. And that's where it has to be a club supported mandate, right? A club supported understanding and honestly, a parent understanding. Look, the first thing I would do and constantly would do with parents would just be to explain, look, we're not going to win. We're not going to win. We're not going to win. And constantly remind them, don't get hung up in this. We're not going to win. We're going to get better. We're going to get better and we're going to get better. And I'm going to notice them getting better. And I'm going to notice, and you're going to notice your son or daughter getting better, but we're not going to win, you know, because this is how we want to win. And if, look, I can be that coach. Like if you want to win, I can be that coach. But to me, that doesn't do the best for my players. And that's where we get hung up in player development versus team development. And that's where I would love for us and what I've tried to do here. And I'm grateful for your club because I know some of the people in your club have this philosophy too, that they're not separate. Player development and team development are not separate. They're the same thing. Like if your players get better, your team gets better and vice versa. So we should approach it more from that perspective as well. But hopefully your club supports it. That's the number one thing. Thanks. Great questions. We have another one, Michael. One second here should be on. No chance. So I will read it. So imagine you have a team in which each player goes two times a week to the gym. They don't ex exercise more times, only team training. How would you set the emphasis? Player-led or coach-led approach? Simple versus decision-making. How does your concept say about exercising plays? Right. So, I mean, this is normal situation for most of you probably, and, and most youth development in North America, the same. You have two times a week with your players in the gym for an hour, hour and a half. And it's like, what do you do with that time? And that's where it comes back to what we just talked about. Does it matter whether you're going to be successful in the games? And if it matters, if you've got to be successful in the games, then you've got to teach them through offense versus defense, how to have solutions versus the things that will hurt them in the game. Now, saying that, it goes back to this original first question, which is, look, I want to give them solutions 
right? So I might have to spend time on simple, but I'm not going to start with simple. I would start from decision making and then reconnect. And I try to explain to people now that I would call drills reconnections. Drills are reconnections. It's not that I'm not going to do two on O pivoting. I'm just not going to start with it. I'm going to do three on three, get out of trouble. Three on three, figure it out. Three on three, two dribbles, dead. And then maybe the next practice, I'm going to do, okay, here's a solution. Dribble to the baseline, jump stop, pivot, pass back behind you. Like how many times do we do pivoting drills where it gives players no context to what they're actually doing in the game? Why don't we do pivoting drills from the three-point line, drive, jump stop, pivot, pass behind you? Right? That to me is a pivoting drill. And that's a solution-based pivoting drill. So I'm not saying don't do those. I'm just saying start from the game context, then reconnect it with the drill, and then go back to the game context. Because now you can actually coach that. Hey, listen, Lorenzo, you could have applied this drill in this situation. Remember this drill we did? This is where you use it. And I think too often we do drills, and then we don't connect them to actually how they use it right? Like if we're now playing three on three in practice, I'm going to stop it and say, hey, listen, this is two on O pivoting right now. You know, when we do that drill where you dribble twice, jump stop, pivot, pass behind you, this is that drill right now. You could have used that as a solution in this drill. So to me, like three on O penetration reaction, different things like that, absolutely teach them, but also connect them to the game for them. Because it's like, oh, this, hey, remember that drill? This is that. The ultimate for all of you as coaches, in my opinion, is this. When your players connect for you, that's what we worked on. That's what we worked on. Hey, coach, that's what we worked on. And now we can do it. Right? To me, that's it. Uh, I mean, that's, that to me is ultimately player development, team development. That's what we worked on. So hopefully we can build that in terms of that. So I know I'm kind of saying both there, Michael, but I would start from decision-making and then go to simple for the things that we really need that we're not doing very well with. So two more questions, Marcus, you got one? Yeah, I've got a whole bunch of questions. I'm just trying to think which one to, to pick, but um, I'll go with a practical one I've got is, do you have any constraints or games that elicit more communication in your players? That's sort of one thing I've been struggling with. Uh, everyone emphasizes it and say, you've got to talk, you've got to talk. And But other than me reminding the players to do it, I haven't found a way that elicits, elicits it naturally. Well, the obvious one is to shut up as a coach, <laughs> yeah. right? It's the yeah. obvious one is just to shut up as a coach because that's hard for us, isn't it? Like, honestly, it's the hardest thing I ever do in practice is shutting up. And I'm not good at it. And it is so hard to do. So that's number one is to be able to just be quiet and let them experience what quiet means and let them experience what no talk means. Uh, the second thing is obviously to notice when communication does happen. It's kind of that positive feedback loop, but it's like, okay, it's not just communication. Look, hey, that communication, Marcus, look how that helped. Uh, look how that helped Lorenzo. That communication helped him. And now that we're connecting the fact that the communication actually added value, because I think too often, and again, uh, you know, American NCA practices are probably the worst of this. You see them on Twitter all the time and you see 30 people in the gym calling ball, 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 ball. And that's what we say is communication. Well, it's not communication. That's, that doesn't add any value to anyone. Communication is adding value that you're helping a teammate in some way. So making sure that players understand what to say, when to say it, and what value does it add. And then by and large, if they start to see the value of it, because I'll tell you, my players, when I used to ball, 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 they, what's the value? I know where the ball is. Why do I have to tell a player where the ball is? If they're on my team and they don't know where the ball is, coach, we have a bigger problem. So it's like value, value, value. Um, Beyond that, uh, I would say a huge, huge part of the communication uh, is, again, not just being quiet, but uh, putting players in situations where they have to communicate. And that would be 
that I don't keep score in practice. I don't substitute in practice. Players have to sub themselves in and out. And if they don't, then they don't, they don't practice, right? Like they have to call the score. They have to communicate the score. They have to know the score, you know, different ways that they should be communicating is they, they should know certain things, right. Uh, to be able to new, know those things, um, echo for their teammates, uh, different kinds of things like that. Yeah. It's a great question. And it's a challenge. And believe me, when I, I can talk about all this stuff, cause I'm a theoretical coach now, uh, but I struggle with all those things too. Great. Thanks. Um, Last one I've got is uh, are there, you've given us a lot of ideas and solutions. Are there any questions or topics that, that you're exploring or still remained unanswered for you? Just out of interest? <laughs> Pretty much everyone, yeah. Uh, really so much of my mindset is to spend time on how to simplify the learning process for coaches and for players, right? To how to get to the point of saying, okay, this is what learning is. This is what it looks like. And to normalize that for others, like to bring attention, because a lot of you nod your head when I talk about some of these things, but then you know that the problem is when a parent watches that, they don't think that's learning. The media doesn't think that's coaching. If I'm not on the sidelines ranting, that's not coaching, right? To me, coaching in a game is sitting there and doing nothing, right? Like that. And we know that that I'm going to get criticized for that. So to help all of us hopefully normalize some of these processes, that's my kind of my next level goal is to be able to do that, you know, through the podcast with some of the questions I ask coaches, and then obviously through, you know, opportunities to be able to share with you, uh, you know, some of these different ideas. And, uh, you know, a lot of it has to come from our, our security as coaches and understanding, you know, what that actually is. Yeah, I think that's the biggest challenge. And um, we're lucky in Germany in a way that some of the structures, like you mentioned, and like our under-12 structure is actually um, put together in a way that's good for play development. We have four and four. Um, the emphasis isn't on winning. We've just introduced a whole bunch of, of rules so that the focus is more on, on development. So um, ho hopefully we can get there in the near future. Can I just add something as I travel around the world too? It's like, look, I'll be honest, probably Germany does a way better job in basketball player development than America, right? I can probably almost to a country say that. The difference is America just has more talent. But by and large, they don't apply most of these things at the youth level at all, mm. right? So you're doing the right things and keep doing them because I just see it all over the place. And uh, uh, Sergio Scarlelli said it on the most recent podcast, you know, when he watched high school teams, they just do drills, 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 right? And by and large, the experience that you're giving kids is, and again, it's a generalization, I don't like them, but you're generally doing the right things because you're developing them in a common sense way, rather than just appealing to the top of the pyramid which tends to be kind of the North American development system is all towards the top of the pyramid and not accounting for the fact that players develop over time. And basketball is a late development sport. If you really think about you as a player, it's a late development sport. You're probably a better player after you stop playing than when you did play even because you understand the game better. That's part of it. So as, as a takeaway, I have a, one last question. Uh, if you have to pick one or two or three uh, skills which a player needs in the next five to 10 years, which would be the, that one? Well, at the youth level, I, I think you can't go wrong at the youth level with ball skills, meaning their ability to be comfortable with the ball, dribbling, passing off the dribble and passing in general. As you move up in levels, we know 100% The number one skill to have fun playing the game and the number one skill in the modern game is shooting. It's shooting. I mean, it's hands down shooting. And I'll tell you, I've yet to meet a player that can shoot the ball well that doesn't enjoy the game, right? There's nothing more enjoyable about the game than shooting, to be able to shoot. And I think that's another challenge sometimes is, you know, we and defense is important. But I'll tell you, like prepubescence, other than developing work ethic, 
if I'm truly talking about team and player development, I'm not spending any time on defense. Like I'm spending all my time on offense because a player's enjoyment of the game and their ability to play the game is directly related to their comfort and confidence on offense, right? No matter what. As a college coach, I can tell you 100% of the time, a coach can tell me how hard their player works and they can tell me how well they compete on defense. And I'll be like, hey, that's, that's awesome. But I'm generally not recruiting that player because I want the player that can play offense, right? And then I can teach them defense or I can develop it. Now, what connects those two things? Work ethic. So at the youth level, if you're developing their passion and excitement to improve and get better, that is a skill. That is a skill that transfers because I think you can teach some of these other things after the fact. But offensive skill, ability to be with the ball, ability to shoot the ball, bam. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks for, for taking your time, which is for sure you have a lot of, of, of stuff to do. Thanks for being here. Thanks everybody who, who was here and also who, who asked questions. But Marcus, could you show how it goes further? Ja, yep, sure. Um, also nochmal für alle zur Erinnerung, wir haben nächste Woche Will Weaver äh, zu Gast, der bei den Houston Rockets jetzt ist als Assistant Coach und da machen wir mit dem Thema Player Development weiter. Er gibt uns seine Eindrücke aus, aus, der NBA, aus seiner Zeit in der NBA und er war jetzt auch ein Jahr äh, Head Coach in Australien ähm, und hat da auch viel in Richtung Spielerentwicklung bewegt. Also da kriegen wir hoffentlich noch mehr coole Ideen und Infos zum Thema Spielerentwicklung. Das war's von meiner Seite. Äh, wer, also Termin steht noch nicht da, das kann ich noch dazu sagen, das müssen wir äh, mit Will absprechen. Das, äh, die haben gerade mit ihrer Vorbereitung angefangen, aber sobald äh, wir einen Termin festgelegt haben, dann werden wir euch Bescheid sagen. That's it from my side. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.